All right, so we got Brian's Winter, Chapter 15. Everything had changed. Somehow he had thought that it would be like normal hunting, except colder and whiter. But it wasn't. It all seemed a different world. He made a breakfast stew and ate while it was still dark and didn't open the shelter until close to ten, when the sun was well up. Brian had never felt such cold, never thought he would see it, never thought that if he did see such cold, he would live through it. He had his hood up and had to breathe slowly in through his nose to warm the air so that it would not stop halfway down his throat. It was colder than before. How cold he couldn't guess, but when he went to the bathroom, some of his urine froze on the way to the ground and broke when it hit and he spit on a clear area of hard-packed snow, and the spit bounced. Still, he did not feel cold. There was no wind, <clears throat> not a breath, and he soon warmed inside his parka as he walked and started to hunt. <clears throat> he hadn't shot in a while and wanted to try some practice shots, but knew he would lose the arrows beneath the snow. He settled for pulling the bow back a few times and flexing his muscles and found that because the parka was so bulky, he had to lean forward a bit to let the bowstring clear his sleeve. Also, he couldn't keep his mitten off for long or his hand would freeze. So he would have, to, he would have time to shake the mitten off before shooting. Game was everywhere. They didn't seem to mind the cold and he saw rabbits all over the place. He couldn't have shot several, but... The moose had spoiled him. There, or he could have shot several, but the moose had spoiled him. There was so much food in the large animal, and only the one death it still bothered him to kill. And it seemed more proper in some way. He would have to kill perhaps 150 rabbits to equal one moose. As it happened, he did not get a moose. He didn't even see a moose. He saw their tracks and they looked fresh, but after following a moose track for more than a mile and seeing no moose and no change in the track, he decided it was impossible to tell a fresh track from an old one in powdery snow. They all looked the same. He was working back toward the camp and had decided that he should start trying to hit rabbits when he saw the deer. It was a buck with only one antler. Brian guessed the other one had gotten knocked off or had never grown. But the buck was good-sized for all that, nowhere near a moose, but large for a deer, and Brian studied the layout carefully. Brian was on a small rise, and the deer was slightly below, standing on the edge of a round frozen pond about 50 yards away, much too far for a shot. The deer was in snow up to its belly, biting the tops off small red willows, eating them slowly, but its air swiveled constantly. And Brian knew he could move no closer directly without being heard. But down and to his left, as he faced the deer, there was a shallow depression that angled toward the buck. Not quite a ditch, yet deep enough to hide everything but his head as he moved and Brian carefully raising and moving his snowshoes forward, slowly, a step at a time, only just clearing the snow, moved down the depression. He watched the deer, only lifted his foot to move when the deer had its head down to bite a willow. A step, another step, slowly, so slowly, and in what seemed hours, he'd moved sideways and 15 yards closer. 35 yards, still too far, twice too far. Wait, another step while the deer ate, another wait. Holding his breath, two steps, one, half a step, 20 yards, 18, 16, 15, 15 long paces. He had learned how to hunt, how to wait for the exact right moment and not waste his shot. And he eased his hand out of the mitten let it hang on its cord, put his fingers to the string where the arrow lay, and waited, frozen, motionless. The deer looked right at him, stared at him, then looked down, back up, stamped its right foot, 
looked at him again, and finally satisfied, turned to take another bite of willow. It would not get better. Bren raised the bow carefully, drew, looked to where the arrow would go, where he wanted it to be, and released. There was a slight thrum of the string, and the arrow leapt away from the bow. The deer heard the sound, had time to start to turn its head, and then the arrow disappeared into its side, just to the rear of the shoulder. Nothing happened. Grind st still stood, holding his breath, the bow still out in front of him. The deer stood, staring at him, seeing him now, feeling the pain of the arrow that had gone into the top of its heart, but still staring and then settling down on its front end slowly and slowly as Brian had walked, then down with its back end and the head curving over to the back until one antler rested on its shoulder and it died that way, looking back and up at the sky. Forever, Brian thought, it took forever. The moose there had been violence, the charge, his killing Lance, but this, this was a kind of murder. I should have missed, he thought, still standing with the bow out in front of him. I should have raised my hand, and the arrow would have gone up a bit, and I would have missed, should have missed. In hunting terms, it was a perfect kill, and it made Brian feel perfectly awful. The deer had been eating, just eating, and it hadn't known he was there, and the arrow had taken it. He shook his head. He had done what he had to do, and it was finished. He had taken me, and it would be wrong now to waste it. He moved to the dead buck. It was a large deer. Before the moose, he would have considered it huge. But he had learned much from handling the moose, and he gutted the deer and peeled the skin back from the belly up to the back on one side, then rolled it and skinned the other side until the hide was free. There were chunks of yellow white fat on the carcass and hanging on the skin as well as he as well and he left them attached for a moment. He had a lot of daylight left, but there was much work to be to do as well. And he started in cutting the legs free as he had with the moose, then chopping the back into pieces. Again he left the head intact and he cut it free from the hide and set it up in the crotch of the tree. He still could not bring himself to look at the eyes, though they were clouded and dull. When the deer was cut up, he laid the skin out flat and put the two legs on it. It was in his mind to use the skin as a carrying pack, but it had lain flat until it was frozen and was as hard and flat as a board or a sled, he thought, looking at it from a different angle. He stacked all the meat with the heart and liver on the skin, then grabbed it where the head had been attached and pulled hard. It slid forward easily, so easily he nearly fell over backward. The buck had thick hair, but it was all slanted to the back. And when he pulled forward, the hairs lay back and let it slide like a flat bottom sled. Slick, he said aloud, really slick. He had planned on making several trips the mile and a half back to camp, but now it could all be done in one. So he took his time, sliding the hide along behind the snowshoe tracks and getting back to the shelter well before dark. I am fat, he said, looking at all he had, the rest of the moose, all the firewood he had got gathered, the shelter, and now the dare. I'm set. Now all I have to do is... He couldn't think of a word. He wanted to say play, but he didn't think in terms of playing any longer. Or maybe it was that he considered it all play. That night he splurged and didn't boil me. Instead, he cut a steak off the dare and broiled it on sticks over the fire. <clears throat> it wasn't perfect. The sticks burned, and the meat fell into the fire twice, and he lost all the juice and the flames, and it smoked up the inside of the shelter so that he had to open the door to clear it out. But it was good. The fat had cooked and burned a little, and he ate until he thought his stomach would burst. During the night, a change awakened him, and he lay with his eyes open in the dark until he realized that a breeze had come up and that the temperature was rising, and the hard bite cold was gone, 
and there would probably be some snow coming. He didn't care. He missed summer and the short fall that he that had followed, but in some ways he liked winter better. He hadn't, he thought, smiling as he went to sleep, seen a mosquito in months. All right, thanks.